In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am.
good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see everybody out here. I hope and trust that you all survived the snowstorm that we had this morning. Uh, I uh, got up and I looked out the window and I told Jane, I said, see, it's snowing. I told you it would snow again this year, but uh, it's great to see everybody here this morning. Just a few announcements here. Uh, as you know, we've been having different people do the artwork on the bulletins. Uh, this is the last one for this year, and it was uh, created by Delise Kratz. A uh, beautiful butterfly, uh, very intricate. Uh, good job, Delise. It looks wonderful. And uh, it's been great to see some of the hidden talents that we have in our congregation here uh, with all these people with great that, have, that can do all this artwork. Just a couple, one more. Someone on Christmas Day. Christmas Day. I always wondered about having a birthday on Christmas Day. You kind of seem to get all the same gifts all at once. You never get two times out of the year. But we have a gentleman in our congregation. He's here today. Ken Crush turned 90 years old, young. How about that? 90 years young on Christmas Day. And Ken... If I look like you at 90, it'll be a good thing. I think that's a pretty good happen. Great day of celebration, I'm sure, for the Crush family. And uh, at this time, Steve Cole has a short announcement about the uh, envelopes and, uh, for this next year. Last week, the, um, the 2019 offering envelopes um, were in your mailbox. Um, I just wanted to briefly remind you about, about um, some um, changes to the way uh, our uh, offering designations um, will work in 2019. The, the um, um, gist of it is that for, on, on the designations for, that are marked um, MCESP, which is the new Mennonite Education Support Plan, as well as missions. These two designations will be completely separated from our budget. So, so really what this means is that any, any offering designation on, on the um, um, MCESP or missions will be accounted for in addition to what was approved by the budget. Um, so really the, the the purpose of those two lines is, is to provide you, the congregation, the opportunity to support those two ministries over and above um, what we had already approved on the budget. So obviously we do want to make um, support of the budget primary um, in, your, in your consideration, but um, um, those options are available to, to give you a little bit more um, uh, ability to direct your giving. So, as always, if you, if you have any questions um, as we roll into the next year, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. All right, that is it for the announcements. Uh, we're going to move into the prayer time here. Uh, you know that uh, we've been praying for Sam Rittenhouse. Um, he's come a long way. He is actually out of the hospital, and he's out at his daughter's uh, place in Leola. He's going to be staying with Debbie and her husband for a few weeks so he gets some of his strength back. In the bulletin uh, on the page on page six, uh, the address that is here is not correct. Uh, the the address is. Um, uh, actually, make a note of this. It's 51 West Ridge Drive. West Ridge Drive, uh, Leola, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is correct. Uh, so, uh, and also, <laughs> Sam is watching. So, so everybody waved to Sam. I talked to him with this, this morning, and he said he's going to be watching. Uh, I called him about a little after 8, I think it was, and I think I woke him up. <laughs> and... Uh, I said, well, now you can go back to bed. He says, no, he doesn't want to be late for church. So uh, he uh, 
It's good to see Sam with his humor back and uh, Sam being Sam. So, but just make a note of the address change. And January 6th is his birthday. So uh, you can maybe combine all, send him a whole bunch of cards. I know Sam would love to get a bunch of cards. So uh, we're just thankful and grateful that Sam is getting better. And uh, hopefully he'll be here soon. Also, another one we've been praying for is Mark Rush, who was Lawrence Rush's brother. He's made great strides also. Uh, talked to Lawrence this morning, and uh, he said that uh, best Christmas gift that Mark got was he was removed from ICU. On Christmas Day, he, um, he got rid of all the tubes and everything, and uh, he is up, still up at... Uh, at Lehigh, I believe, and he is recovering and looking to what's next would be some kind of rehab. So we uh, two prayer of praises here for the people that uh, I know a lot of people have been praying for Sam and Mark through this time. Um, I believe that is it for the uh, prayer. Don't forget to pray for all the ones that are listed uh, in the bulletin also. All right, will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for another day. Another day to get up and uh, spread your love to people all around us. And as we move from the Christmas season to the uh, new year, I just pray that each one of us, uh, as we start a new year, renews our vows that we took to serve you, to love you, to honor you, to walk with you, to make you Lord of our lives, Father. This is something we should be doing every day, Lord. And as we do move into a, a, a new year, I just pray that uh, for everyone that uh, uh, 2019 will be a great year where great things can happen. Uh, Lord, we just pray again for this new year and how we can build your kingdom to all those that are around us. And we just, again, thank you for the gift of another day. And we thank you, Lord, for the uh, um, worship that has taken place, Lord. And I just know that the worship that we've had this morning was glorifying to you. And I just pray that uh, everything we do is glorifying to you. Uh, Lord, for all the prayer requests, especially for Sam, we are so grateful that he is out of the hospital, he's home, he's recuperating, uh, and uh, again, we thank you for uh, family as uh, he is staying with his uh, daughter, Debbie, and her husband out in uh, Leola. Lord, I just pray that you continue to heal Sam, and we just pray that we see him sitting here in the, in the pews ver someday very soon, Lord, but we do thank you again for Sam. We thank you for his life, and we thank you for the way he's uh, uh, just trusted you and leaned on you through this illness. And Lord, for Mark, Mark Rush, um, Lord, we are thankful that uh, he is doing better. He is out of ICU. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you continue to heal Mark, to, uh, to um, uh, continue to give him strength when he feels weak. Lord, we just know that uh, you are with him, and we thank you for the healing that is happening and that has taken place in Mark's life. And Lord, for all the other prayer requ uh, requests, we lift them up to you, Father. I just pray that each one finds comfort when they uh, look to you and that you can be with them for whatever they're going through, Lord. You're a great and loving God, and we thank you for this. And now as we uh, take, take the offering, as we give back to you, I just again pray for each one that gives. Lord, um, again, we have so much. We have so much to be thankful for, and I just pray that each one that gives back will be blessed with this act of service to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. One other thing I kind of forgot. The men's retreat is coming up on the 8th. Uh, Mark Rush was planning on going with us. He is not going. So we have one extra. We can take one extra person if you want to go to hear Daryl Strawberry. Uh, speak. Um, I forget the other gentleman names, gentleman's name that's speaker, speaking. We have one extra ticket, and the cost is 119 and make your checks payable to the church. We're going to send a check up uh, from the church. So if you have any questions, talk to me.
From the high and holy to a manger lowly, the greatest mystery the world has ever known. How you left your majesty to embrace humanity, it awes and humbles me to be loved by a God so high. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but praise you? Every day make everything I do. A hallelujah, a hallelujah. In our grief and brokenness, you suffered by our side. From a cradle to the cross, rising up victorious, the Messiah Jesus, born to us on that holy night. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but praise you? Every day make everything I do. A hallelujah, a hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but praise you? Every day make everything I do. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but praise you? Every day make everything I do. A hallelujah, a hallelujah, hallelujah. stand as we sing hymn number 359. I 
for this morning is going to be from Philippians 3, 12 to 21. Uh, it's a good New Year's passage. It's entitled, Pressing On Toward the Goal. Now, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straighting toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called, called me heavenward to Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, then too God will make clear, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brother, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is de destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who by the power that... In a, a, I'm sorry, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Blessings, Lord, as you can bring us the message. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, before, before I launch into the road ahead, let me take a, a moment to glance in 
the rear view mirror. Now you know that uh, there's a reason the rear view mirror is smaller than the windshield. You should spend most of your energy looking through the windshield, looking ahead, and only a minimal amount of time looking behind. Um, for a lot of reasons, I've been thinking about the past, and um, my mind went back to when I was 10 years old. Over on the farm where the Walmart is, um, my father, when I was about 10, uh, took the trip to Lansdale to Swartley Brothers, had a store on Main, Main Street, and he did the unthinkable. He bought our first television set. Now, I've thought about it. I, my father's been gone for a few years, and I never really had the chance, never thought about asking him uh, what were the repercussions for buying that TV set. I know that it looked something like this. Um, it was on a portable cart like that, so that if the wrong person came in the house, it could be quickly shoved into the closet and hidden. Um, it was black and white. Uh, by today's standard, very small. It was 19-inch uh, black and white TV. And the kids will think this is funny, but we actually had to get up off the sofa to, uh, to change channels. That top one there gave us what was called VHF, uh, channel 3, 6, 10, maybe 12 was on that one. And then below was the UHF dial. And if you properly positioned the rabbit ears, you could pick up 17, 29, 48, 57. So uh, if my math is right, you had about seven channels. You even had to get up off the sofa to change the volume. Black and white. That was all that I needed at age 10 because my world was largely black and white. Uh, the TV set would uh, distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. The cowboy movies, the good guys wore the white hats, rode the white horses. The bad guys wore the black hats and rode the black horses. So all you really needed was black and white since our world was very black and white. You all right? Whoa. Sounds like we're in a cave. Ah, uh, there you go. The interesting thing is, the plot was always the same. The good guys would win, the bad guys would lose. When I got here to this church at age 10, I was actually here from age three months, three weeks, but at age 10 I realized that the same people that wrote the scripts for the movies were writing our Sunday school curriculum. Because there was always a good guy and they're always a bad guy. There was Moses, and there was Pharaoh. There was David, and there was Goliath. There was Elijah, the 450 prophets of Baal. There was Jesus and Pilate. You had no trouble distinguishing between the good guys and the bad guys in the Sunday school class. It was black and white. The older I've gotten, I'm not quite as old as Ken, 
but I'll catch him. Um, not quite 90 yet, but the older I've gotten, the more gray has come in to our world, and things are not quite as clear as they were back in 1960. In today's world, you can't distinguish from outward appearance who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Our world has gotten fairly complex, and some of the people we think are good guys turn out to be bad guys, and some of the bad guys have some good in them, and in reality, the good guys don't always win. In today's world, and I'm losing uh, sound here, I'll, I'll, let's just use this, Merle. I don't know, maybe my battery's dead. I'll just stand here and behave. We use this. Um, good guys, let me shut this off and then we won't have the feedback issue and we'll just go with the podium. There's a bad guy in our sound system this morning. Um, actually, William Bennett put it like this. Our country has become the kind of country civilized countries used to send missionaries to. When it comes to values, when it comes to good and bad, evil and righteousness, um, we largely uh, are, are all over the place. John Stott said many of the happenings of today's society would not exist if it were not for human sin. A promise today is not enough. We need a written contract. Doors are not enough. We need bolts and locks. Today we need security cameras. The payment of fares is not enough. We have to be issued tickets, which are punched, inspected, and collected. Law and order is not enough. We need policemen to enforce those laws. In the midst of a spiritually bankrupt world, in a country that measures morality by the latest opinion poll, have we allowed the light of Jesus Christ to transform our values and set our direction? On page four, I put a very familiar verse, one that Paul read. One thing I do forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This one thing I do. Now, for many of us, that sounds preposterous. Talked to Cindy Rush this morning back in the fellowship hall as she was making coffee. She said, I need a break. I need some rest. I've got 12 grandchildren age 5 and down. Any parent with two or three kids in today's world, most of us would say, this one thing I do doesn't make sense in 2018. I would remind you of Matthew 6, 33. 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. So what we're really talking about is a priority which puts Jesus first. The one thing that the Apostle Paul was talking about is the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Paul read verse 12. Paul says, I strive to take hold of the thing for which Christ took hold of me. The King James word is apprehended. God apprehended me for a purpose, and my goal in life is to achieve that purpose. That's the one thing. If your Bible is open to Philippians 3, turn back one page and look at Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 12. Now I want you to know what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Looking back, Paul is in prison. He is looking back over his life and he said, all that has happened to me, when things happen to you, when you look in your past, when you look back a week, a month, a year, or 50 years, you may not understand the reason or what was going on at the time, but you can thank God for the results, for what it did in your life, if it has helped to advance the gospel, which is good news, if it has accomplished that, that's the purpose. That is the one thing. What happened to Paul? He was arrested. He faced a angry crowd. He was beaten in public. He was brought before the Sanhedrin. There was a plot to kill Paul. All oh, this is in Acts 21 through 28. You can read of the ordeals. What has happened to me? His trial before Felix, his trial before Festus, his trial before Agrippa, being shipwrecked on the way to Rome and landing in a Roman prison, handcuffed to a, a guard 24-7. If you look back, and if you're not careful... If you're not focused on the one thing, glorifying God, accomplishing His purposes, seeing His kingdom, seeking Him and His kingdom and His righteousness, if you look back with the wrong motives and judge by worldly standards, you face the risk of resentment and regret. Um, resentment is actually regrets turned inward. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can review your timeline. You can go back through the years and see the posts that you've made, the comments that people have made, and you can review a timeline of your life. If you're not careful you can allow some of those events to produce regret and resentment in your life. If your life is filled with regrets, some of you, frankly, have had a bad 2018. Some of you look back. There are people in prison today that have made mistakes. They have regrets. They have resentments. 
There are people in, in prisons that do not have literal bars, but they're walking around in prison with regret, with resentment. If your life is filled with regret and resentment, try Paul's perspective. All of the trials in life have really served to advance the gospel. Philippians 1.12 And produce something in you and in me that will advance the kingdom of God. By the way, next week I'm going to preach a sermon which will hopefully help us think about how together each of us as a body of Christ here at Line Lexington, can minimize our personal goals and agendas for the common good. If this church will move forward in 2019, it will be because all of us have decided to lay down our personal priorities, our soapboxes, and our preferences for the common good of this congregation. And we will move together in unity and in power based on what is best for the congregation as a whole, not what my individual preference happens to be. You may not understand the reasons for all that has taken place in your life from age 10 till now, but you can thank God for the results. You're here this morning. You're in reasonably good health. We have all kinds of reasons to be pessimistic about 2019. If you looked at your 401k, it's depressing. If you watch the 6 o'clock news, it's depressing. If you have family members or friends who have stumbled and fallen, and maybe even yourself, there's something inside that you're ashamed of. And you're praying that 2019 will be different. All I can say is adopt the attitude of the Apostle Paul who says all that happened was for this purpose to produce in me a clear message of a gospel which is now being proclaimed with boldness and courage. There are six different ways you can apply the one thing principle in your life. The first one is in worship. Psalm 27, 4, I've asked for one thing. That is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. So the psalmist says, I'm not waiting till I take my last breath I want to dwell in the house of the Lord here and now. That's the one thing I desire, that I might see his beauty and feel his courage and strength. The second one, put Christ above all else. This is a tough one. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus with his, his issues, and Jesus says, uh, have you tried this, 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 and this? And he said, I've done all of that. Jesus said, one thing you still lack. One thing. Go sell all you have and then come and follow me. Possessions, stuff, schedules, all the stuff. We were talking, I was talking to somebody about downsizing. What am I going to do with all my stuff? One thing you lack. The third way you can apply the one thing principle, 
sit at Jesus' feet, study his word. Martha, Martha, you're worried, you're upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice. Sit at Jesus' feet in 2019. Adopt the position of the blind man in John 9. Being questioned by the religious folks after Jesus had restored his, had, had healed his sight. Who is this guy? Is he a prophet? Is he from Satan? Where does he get his power? The, the former blind man looked them in the eyeball and said, whether he's a prophet or not, I can't tell you. But one thing I know, I was once blind, but now I see. Tell people what Jesus has done for you. Don't look backward, look forward. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind. And be ready for Christ's return. 2 Peter 3, 8, dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. This one thing I do. Uh, direction. I forgot to get to put that up. You mean I did that whole thing with you staring at a television set? Direction. Forget what is behind. Press on toward what is ahead. I need somebody running my clicker. That's what I need. How will you start a new year? Some people simply start chronologically. They merely hit the reset button on the calendar of life. Others begin accidentally with little thought or planning. Some approach the year circumstantially, waiting to see how circumstances determine their attitude and their response. Positive people begin expectantly, looking for and hoping for the best. What about intentionality? Do we understand the importance of turning good intentions into positive and productive action. The first big step toward a new year is release. You can't go forward holding on to the past. You can't embrace tomorrow if you're weighed down by yesterday. Vance Havner wrote it this way, memories whether good or bad, must be handled with care. Bad recollections can drive us to despair. Good remembrances can become idols and lead us to wallow in sentimentality. We can paint the past with glamour that it never had, an idealized past. You hear some people embellish the stories of the past and you say, you know, they say, we want to go back there. Well, if it was that good, why aren't you there? You can embellish the past and crown dear ones with halos that they never wore. Havner's words are distance lends 
lends enchantment to the view. Distance. Memory can become a tyrant instead of a treasure chest. From the mistakes of the past, let us learn whatever lessons they teach, then forget them, even as God remembers our sins no more. Let precious memories be benedictions, but not bonds. Life must be lived. We must get on with the job. Whatever you have done, God is for you. Wherever you have wandered, God is with you. However you struggle, God understands you. Whatever you feel inside, guilt, shame, God loves you. When he looks at you, there is grace in his eyes, and his heart is an ocean of mercy. Um, here's an interesting book. I have, I've got a ton of books in my library, but I don't have this one. I just ordered it. You can go to Abe's Books and buy $20 books for $3. Uh, it's on the way because anybody that writes a book, discovering the consequences of sowing and reaping. One of the themes of my preaching over 35 years has been the consequences of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he or she reap. In his book, there are two days in every week about which we should not worry. Two days which should be kept from fear and apprehension. The first is yesterday. With its mistakes and cares, its aches, its pains, its faults, its blunders, yesterday has passed forever beyond our control. All of the money in the world cannot bring back yesterday. We cannot undo a single act we performed. We cannot erase a single word we said. Yesterday is gone. The other day we should not worry about is tomorrow with all its possible adversities, its burdens, its large promise and poor performance. Tomorrow is beyond our immediate control. Tomorrow's sun will rise. Either in splendor or behind a mask of clouds, but it will rise. Until it does, we have no stake in tomorrow, for it is yet unborn. That leaves only one day, and that's today. Any person, by the grace of God, can fight the battles of just one day. It is only when you and I add the burdens of those two awful eternities, yesterday and tomorrow, that we break down. It is not the experience of today that drives men mad. It is remorse or bitterness for something which happened yesterday and the dread of what tomorrow might bring. Let us therefore journey but one day at a time. Remember the devil's two R's, resentment and regret. Um, here's a picture for you. On May 6, 1954, Roger Bannister became the first man in history to run a mile in less than four minutes. Within two months, John Landy broke the record by 1.4 seconds. On August 7, 1954, the two met together for what historians now call the Miracle Mile. 
uh, Bannister and Landy racing against each other. As they moved into the last lap, Landy held the lead. It looked as if he would win, but as he neared the finish line, he was haunted by the question, where is Bannister? As he turned to look, Roger took the lead and won by 0.8 seconds. This statue was sculptured from a photograph taken of that fateful moment. After the sculpture was made, uh, John Landy said this, Lot's wife looked back, was turned into a pillar of salt. I'm probably the only one in history who ever turned and looked back and was turned into a bronze statue. <laughs> Not yesterday, but today and tomorrow. Relinquishing what is behind, pressing forward with determination. There's two things obvious in verse 14. Paul is not standing still, but the second thing that's obvious, he is standing firm. I'm moving forward, but I'm moving toward the goal, the prize, that which God has apprehended me for. Not all forward movement is progress. Standing still is not an option, but we better be standing firm. I, I read, I couldn't sleep last night, about three o'clock I read a post by uh, Franklin Graham, who's getting hammered by Facebook for a post he made two years ago when he picked on Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen canceled the concert in uh, one of the North Carolina cities, I think, over the issue of gay rights. Franklin Graham posted, uh, Bruce Springsteen said something like, uh, these Christians are trying to take us back to some uh, puritanical time in history, Franklin Graham replied, uh, not all what we believe is forward movement, what we believe is progress is actually success in the eyes of God. And if we have to go backwards for some things, we will, because we stand for biblical truth. Forward movement must be toward the prize. The very words of Paul in Philippians 1.12, I want you to know what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, and I press on toward the goal. A.W. Tozer said the normal Biblical direction is not backwards, it is always forward. The prodigal son did not get up one morning in the pig pen and say, I will go back to my father. I, he didn't say, I'm going back. He said, I will arise and go to my father. From where he was, going to his father's house, was a forward step in his moral activities. It represented no retreat, but a distinct advance over his previous conduct. The will of God is always the proper goal for every one of us. Where God is must be the place of desire. Any motion toward God is forward motion. Frankly, if you've got regret, if you've got some stuff that's unresolved in the past, 
Um, remorse and regret should be followed by three more R words. Repentance, uh, revision, and resolution. Repentance, going back to the place where wrongs were committed and making them right, is forward progress. Even repentance is not a retreat toward the past, but a decided march into a more glorious future. Restitution is not a return to yesterday, but a step into a blessed tomorrow. Um, John Maxwell. John Maxwell put it this way: Risk must be evaluated not by the fear it generates or the probability of your success, but by the value of the goal. If you're going to take a risk in 2019. Don't worry about the fear that it instills in your heart and don't worry about the probability of, the, of, of success. Measure the risk by the value of the goal. I press on to win the prize. Oh, Got to wind it down. Dan Sullivan uh, and Catherine Numura wrote a book, which I also ordered yesterday. It needs to be in my library. In about six months, I got a dispense of 6,000 books, and I keep adding books. So you figure that out. Here's what they say. As children, when we're all growing at a rapid rate, we ask lots of questions. As we get older, we gradually begin to think that we have a lot of the answers. For some people, their entire sense of security and self-image depends on having all the answers, on never being wrong. As a result, these people try to understand everything in terms of what we know. But all growth lies in the territory of the unknown. If you're going to be settled in to what you already know, you have slammed the door on growth. Growth takes place in the areas of the unknown. What we already know is in the past. What we have yet to discover is in the future. Always make your questions bigger than your answers. And you'll keep drawing yourself into a bigger future with new possibilities. Here's a picture that got me. And I added a quote that I don't even know where it came from. But it says, you'll see how rich you are when you add up everything that you have that money cannot buy and that death cannot take away. Do you want to be rich? Add up everything you have that money can't buy and that death cannot take away. Continual learning, says Dan Sullivan, is essential for lifetime growth. You can have a great deal of experience and be no smarter for all the things you've done. All the things you've done, seen, and heard can have little to no effect on your life. Experience alone is no guarantee of lifetime growth. But if you regularly transform your experiences into new lessons, you will make each day of your life a source of growth. The smartest people on earth are those who can transform even the smallest events or situations into breakthroughs in thinking and in action. Look at all of life as a school. 
and every experience as a lesson. And your learning will always be greater than your experience. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, who after all of the difficult experiences of life, said, I am thankful that it happened because it advanced the gospel. And a man in prison who could say this one thing I do, what is behind, I forget about. What is ahead, I press on to accomplish. I press on toward the goal. God, I pray that each of us, every one of our situations is different, and yet there's so many similarities. I pray that each of us would learn from the past, would access uh, your resources, the gift of the Holy Spirit, who teaches, who guides, who leads, today in our lives, that we would not fear the future, we would not measure the probability of success, but we would uh, strive because of the value of the prize. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing the song that John Aldifer would have kicked off had he been sitting here. Tell them I'm pressing on the upward way.
All right. And then next week, when you see your neighbor, ask him if they're on higher ground than they were the week before. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would do exceedingly above and beyond that which we could ask or imagine according to your power, which is at work mightily in us. I pray that you would do what we can't do. You would use us, Lord, uh, to speak your word, your truth, to show your compassion and your love in whatever situations we find ourselves in this coming year. In Jesus' name we pray. Go in peace.